Welcome to the Market Mentors Podcast, Asia. Thank you so much for having me. Super pumped to be here. Absolute pleasure. So before we get stuck into this one, I'd love to know what your relationship is with B2B marketing. Uh, so my relationship with it, uh, is, uh, it's a long one. I've been, I've been in B2B marketing in some form or fashion for the last, I would say 10, 11 years, and it's been a whirlwind, but learn, I'm still learning and yeah. I'm, you know, I'm just excited to, to share what, to share what I know. Fantastic. And I was looking at your profile. You've mentored and helped a lot of startups. You know, you've worked in marketing for B2B tech startups, and you've also sat on the board of Moz. So you definitely get the, the startup marketing space. So in relation to what we're talking about today, what do you think are some of the, the main reasons that you see founders or even sort of early stage marketers struggle to get their first customers? Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with founders and then I'll move over into marketers. The with founders, typically it's something to do with impatience and a combination of that with not really understanding their actual paying customer. So um, founders, especially if they are technical founders, uh, uh, with a technical founder, if they're technical, they're used to really short learning cycles. So for example, you write code, you deploy code, you know almost instantaneously if uh, code works or not. And that short feedback loop is something that a lot of technical founders are very used to. When you get into something like marketing, uh, I like to explain it like marketing is kind of like long term code deployments that you're not necessarily going to know instantaneously or mm. even ever exactly mm. if and how it works. And that's really scary for a lot of technical founders. And so what happens is they start the marketing process. They start thinking about how to acquire their very first customers. And they're so used to short feedback loops that it's actually really hard for them to see the long-term effects of marketing. And yes, of course, you want short-term tactics. You want short-term things that get you customers. Um, but the reality is that when it comes to marketing, you're ultimately dealing with people. You're not dealing with code. So it takes longer for people to make decisions. It takes longer for people to, uh, to really believe in what it is that you are building and that it can ultimately help solve their problem. And it just takes longer to actually find you in the first place. So usually impatience is what prevents founders and like these early teams from getting their first 100 customers. They try a lot of stuff. When it doesn't instantaneously work, they quit and they move on to the next thing. And then they say, oh, you know, this doesn't work for us or that doesn't work for us. But really, it, like if they weren't executing it in a very meaningful way and also if it wasn't deployed very well, then it wasn't going to work anyway. So hmm. something to think about. Um, the other thing that I think that we see, and we see this actually for both marketing and also for founding teams, but it's really understanding the customer. Uh, it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me how many teams, you know, like the way that they actually engage with a customer is primarily through like support tickets or talking to the customer in that way. And sometimes like, like what they'll do is they'll hop on a sales call or a demo call and, and they'll ask like three or four like discovery type questions. And then they get straight to the product and they ask like, you know, like, oh, like, you know, what features are interesting and blah, blah, blah. And then it becomes more about the product, which is great. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. That's you're supposed to do that. Uh, but it becomes so much more about the product and far less about really understanding, like what was the customer going through? Mm -hmm. What have they been comparing you against? Why did like, what were they doing or using before? And why are they switching to your solution now? Mm -hmm. um, what was the ultimate trigger moment that led them to even consider the solution? Like those types of questions that really get to the heart of the full journey. And understanding this piece is also critical. So what we find is teams that really struggle with acquisition, nine times out of 10, it's because they just don't actually understand their customer. And they're trying a whole lot of things that don't actually match with what the customer experience looks like. And also they don't really understand like what's triggering a customer to consider the solution anyway. Mm, makes sense. And going back to your first point around impatience, you see it in the jobs market, don't you? You see marketeers going into companies and coming out quite quickly because the expectations aren't there between the marketing team and the sort of founder team. Um, they run out of patience too quickly and they expect far too much too quickly. Um, so invariably, you see quite a high churn with, with marketeers going into sort of early stage startups. That's right. Um, yeah. Um, we also see like some of the typical stuff like budget. Of course, there's time. But I would say impatience and a lack of understanding of the customer. Those are usually the top two that we see. Makes sense. So you're a founder or even a, a startup's first marketer then. What stage does your startup need to be at before you start getting new customers? Yeah. 
Okay, so this is an interesting one. Uh, and there's really there's really two paths that a company can take. So the first is if I mean, I mean, baseline stage is actually pretty easy. You either need to have the MVP ready or you need to be like 80 percent of the way to the MVP. And there's really two paths that you could take. The first path is uh, there's drumming up a lot of interest and signups or some kind of like lead capture before the product ever like launches. Mm. And then there's also the opportunity for, okay, maybe the the product is now live. It's got a website. uh, You're able to like someone can actually sign up for it and get access to it or book a demo or whatever it is. And um, now we like start the marketing process. I, I pretty much always err on the side of get it, like start the process as early as you possibly can. Mm. However, this isn't always possible or feasible for every company. And usually the constraints are just going to be about bandwidth, budget, the things that you would typically think about and consider here. Uh, but if you have less bandwidth, less budget, then you're probably going to spend your time focusing on that MVP and then getting it to a place where you feel comfortable launching it. And then, of course, um, you start the marketing process from there. But if you are building the product, building the MVP, and it's not just a team of like one solo founder, it's, you know, you've got you can afford a team of like engineers, maybe an early stage marketing person or, you know, whoever, then then you can certainly start planting the seeds for starting marketing even earlier. There are some companies that are VC funded that uh, they literally built product and were in like stealth mode for two to three years before they ever like launched. But they were still doing marketing. It was just their marketing looked a lot different. It was much more about uh, seeding some early customers and early users, learning as much as they possibly could, and then building the MVP and improving the MVP. And then, of course, um, realizing that they actually needed a much bigger MVP and then waiting about two to three years before they actually officially launched in the market. And then there are some companies that, you know, like they build the product in three months and it, now it's done. And now they're like, oh, crap, we need a website. And that's <laughs> very normal, too. Um, mm. We see we we see more, I think, of the latter than the former. But mm. um, I would like there's not really a hard rule. The only thing I would say avoid like the plague is going too long without with absolutely zero marketing. Mm. And you get like in a tough, scary spot because now you don't have any runway anymore or, um, you know, like there's all kinds of like constraints there. But mm. but yeah, I would I would try to get it in as early as you can, of course, with respect to time and budget. Yeah, indeed. You, you hit. Uh, yeah, you make a really good point there, actually, because there are some organizations that have started marketing, like you say, even before the product's been out in the market and they're building a community and a brand and a net and they're just starting to get followers behind it so that when you've got a product, you've got actually something to go to rather than starting from cold, which is is quite an unusual way of doing it. If you if you look at how marketing should be done in the textbooks. But, uh, you know, we shouldn't always follow textbooks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> There's. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's just more competition now than ever. And Indeed. there's more things wanting people's attention now than ever. So I would say if you can get it in early and if you can understand it as fast as possible, you'll you'll usually be be pretty good. Indeed, indeed. Now, you talked about a few different points there. Some of the stuff you were talking about s- certainly earlier on was was more around that sort of product marketing piece. So, you know, I guess the sort of first step is is really understanding your audience and making sure that you're not targeting too broad an audience. Um and those are those kind of like product marketing elements. But at this sort of stage then, what do you think people can be doing to make sure that when they start going to market, they're going to market to the right people with the right message? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's one of those things where every founder or at least every founding team that I talk to in this stage everyone is usually overconfident about their level of product market fit. Mm. (laughs) And it just, it just is what it is. Mm. Uh, I can tell you that true product market fit, it, you can feel it. It feels Mm. like you are in a kayak or a raft raging like down a river and you can't like everything that you do to try to stop the kayak. It's not going to like your kayak isn't going to stop. That's product market fit. (laughs) And it's like, it's a great feeling. Uh, most teams when they first start out don't have product market fit. And so 
what they have to do is they have to work towards that. It's a process for literally every company. Um, doesn't really matter if you're SaaS, software, or even services. You could be a B2B, B2C. You've got to work towards product market fit in some kind of way or service market fit if you want to think about it like services. Hmm. And the process for this, I mean, it's really going to start with really understanding what is it that your customers are hiring your product for. Uh, we call this jobs to be done. So if you're familiar with jobs theory, uh, jobs theory comes up a lot with product marketing and product in general, but we can actually use this for understanding acquisition and for understanding what ultimately triggers or uh, what is the context upon which customers buy, but then also even more specifically buy our product. And with product market fit in general, the process as a whole is really understanding with where our product is today, what is the market that is most likely going to buy this for a, for a price that, you know, yeah, it is a fair or equal exchange. And sometimes we find that we don't have enough product and for the particular market that we're going after. And sometimes we start with, uh, we, we have the wrong market entirely. And the product market fit game is really a game of understanding that. And we can actually use jobs to be done to understand that. And the first thing that we do is we're going to do customer discovery. We're going to do customer development and we're going to ask them job style questions. And then from there, you are going to analyze that data, pull the top two to three job stories out of those job stories. There's probably one job story that your product just like absolutely nails it at. And then after that, with that job story, you're now going to say, OK, here are the top two to three customer segments within that that you know want to complete their fulfill this job story. And now we have. Uh, you know, very early product market fit tests that we can run. So we can say, okay, what does it look like to go after segment number one? What does it look like to go after segment number two? What does it look like to go after segment number three? And that's usually what that process looks like. Uh, it's super rare. I've only ever seen it, I think, like one time. <laughs> but uh, it's like infinitely rare to launch a product and it just be like the perfect thing mm. that everyone wants. And there's already an audience waiting for you. And on top of that, like they're super happy, non-churning high LTV paying customers. Like that mm. is, it's, uh, you know, that's magical thinking. It's, mm. uh, I would expect that to not be the case. Actually, I would expect to have to work towards product market fit in some kind of mm. way. And that's really the process that we use to understand that and to get there. Um, and I want to say that that was your question. Hopefully it was. <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> okay, cool. I mean, the famous story, right right or wrong, I'm not sure if this is this is true, but the story with Airbnb, isn't it? So Airbnb started, you know, they started pretty slowly. Um, and actually a lot of the, the time in terms of acquisition, they were, they were targeting, I think, listings on Craigslist or something. So, uh, and it wasn't really until they started to, to send, I think quite manually, people around to actually photograph the, the places that were coming on Airbnb that actually started to, to sort of take off. So, um, you know, you think of these organizations just being fast out the gate, but a lot of the time they're, they're not, like you said, they're still struggling to find out you know, that, that market, the fit and all, all that kind of stuff. So, and essentially what you're saying there is, is start thin, isn't it? So it's not to say your product does all these different things. You're trying to understand what is the most important thing and what is that most important thing versus what the customer wants and versus how we can go against our competitors or the, 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 the incumbents in the market. So you've got a good chance of, of getting people in to do that job in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, um, there's a stat. Actually, there's, there's two things I wanted to add to that. Um, first, uh, most people don't know this, but it actually took Airbnb about 10 years before they got to where they were today, wow. uh, which most people have no idea that like it took them that long. It took them mm. a very long time. Like they were literally, yeah, like they were like using Craigslist and, and there was like a solid two to three years where they didn't even build product really. They were just um, kind of like hacking things together. <laughs> and anyway, um, but the other thing I wanted to mention was, yes. So when you think about product market fit, Usually it's, it's uh, infinitely better to mm. focus on a specific market, so a specific segment or set of segments and build for that audience than it is to build a product and then have mm. to figure out what market to sell it to. Mm. If you focus on the market first and then figure out, okay, what's the right product to build, you're, you're going to have a way faster journey. You're going to have a way better time in general than if you were to build something in isolation or build something with half-baked data or, in, or information, mm. and then try to figure out, you know, who do I sell this to? Mm. Um, it can literally save you two to 10 years on average is what we've seen. Um, so companies that, that 
go the ladder. It just takes them longer because they have to spend more money, more resources and more energy testing a lot of different segments. And testing is even like, you know, I'm going to put that in finger quotes because it's actually really hard to test a segment. Hmm. Um, But going the opposite way of this is a particular market that we want to serve. They are under like this particular part is underserved Mm. or um, there's competitors that aren't serving their needs like in the way that they, that they really should be. And we can do it way better. And, you know, here's maybe the top two to three segments we're going to really focus on in that market. And then they, you know, build what they need to build and then go to market that way. It's just a much more powerful journey. It's going to be way faster. And I think you're going to be a happier founder and also happier marketing team as well, because you'll actually know what you're selling <laughs> and yes. uh, you'll know that there's actually a market like on the other end of it. Well, like you said at the start, it's just so competitive these days, isn't it? You know, it's hard to find a market that hasn't, isn't been served by something. So, uh, you know, having that clear message is, is, is crucial, really. So that sort of early early stage, then, we've, we've talked about sort of the jobs to be done framework and kind of understanding who the customers might be and the kind of messages and that kind of stuff. And that's almost like that early foundational work to kind of hypothesize about okay these are the things that we think are going to work in terms of then the actual doing it they kind of go to market then and kind of getting stuff going out there what should people be thinking about from that perspective yeah so go to market is an interesting it's an interesting phrase because it means a lot of different things to different people Mm. but when i hear go to market and when i discuss go to market with other founders usually what we're talking about is we're talking about um what is the actual product like what does it literally do what is it uh, who is it for? So what is the market that we're ultimately selling it to? What is the model that we are going to offer the product to the market for? So model meaning, is it going to be freemium? Is it a free trial? Are you going to offer a 14 day? Um, how many plans are we going to offer? If any plans, is there one plan? Um, are we doing monthly, monthly recurring? Are we doing annual? What is the pricing? Like those are all model questions. Then we get into channels. So if we know what our product is and we're going to serve this market, um, we need channels to actually, you know, push that market, that product through. And we also get into other aspects of go to market. So we naturally get into positioning. So how are, um, how should, like, what is the context that customers should view us in order to buy us, which is really what positioning is. And Mm -hmm. then we get into messaging. How do we best communicate that positioning? Uh, what is the buyer's journey? So what do we ultimately anticipate buyers experiencing that triggers them into even thinking about this product in the first place? KPIs for success. And then from there, the list can kind of go on. Mm. Mostly though, with go-to-market, go-to-market is really a definition stage. It's mm. we are defining things and we're really sticking to them. Mm. Definition or excuse me, go-to-market is also, um, it is strategy. And with strategy, strategy is about choices. It's about what we're going to do and what we're consequently not going to do. So with go to market, you're in the process of defining, but you're also tell like you're saying what you're going to do, but you're also saying what you're not going to do. And this is where a lot of teams, especially in the earlier days, get tripped up because go to market is is a little bit too fluffy. It's not really Mm -hmm. been defined. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they've not very clearly uh, identified what the trade offs are. So, for example, a lot of people treat the go-to market, you know, definition or strategic phase as something that is kind of loosey-goosey and like, you know, it can be whatever, but they end up spreading themselves really thin and then Mm. they end up with challenges down the road because they can't figure out who their best customer actually is and like who Mm. they should really be focused on. And then they're, you know, confused go-to market wise. And Mm. this is why go-to market is so critical. Uh, But also if they don't actually spend their time here then they could actually be making compromises that they're not even aware of. Mm. So this is kind of where go-to-market is pretty critical. Um, But yeah, I would say that's like the big list. There's Mm. a few other things too that some people would consider inside of go-to-market. But yeah, I would say that's that's definitely the basis. Perfect, perfect. And I'd say that some companies you know, perhaps jump into the next stage that we're going to talk about without having done the, the two stages prior. Um, so if we're thinking about sort of getting our 100 customers then, we're kind of getting onto the, if you like, the juicy bit, which is sort of getting into to actually activating, act, act, activating some of these channels. So from that perspective then, how then do we decide, okay, we've, we've done our jobs to be done bit, we've done our go-to-market planning, the strategy sort of stuff. We're going to then start to think about what channels to use then. How do you think people should be thinking about that then to make sure we're actually going to deliver some some customers in? Yeah, I love this. I love this question because uh, it's definitely one of those cart before horse situations. A lot of people, they start, they start their go-to market and like their, their growth or early stage process with channels first. Hmm. But the irony with that is 
there's no amount of like article reading or Googling that you can do that's going to tell you like exactly what your customers, like what channels are there that they're going to hang out in. Um, that's actually only partially true. There's definitely some Googling that you could do, but you really don't know until you actually talk to them. So if you get to the stage where you're like, okay, I'm ready to start thinking about marketing channels and also growth channels, I'm going to include that in there too. Um, but if you're ready to think about marketing channels, if you've done your research, this stage actually shouldn't be shocking at all to you. It should be something that you actually already know because you've done your research. Uh, typically what happens is companies will get to this like channel definition stage where they're like, okay, like what channels do we actually invest in? And they have no idea because they actually haven't done the research. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. like, okay. Um, but assuming that you've done your research and you've done it well, you should ideally know what channels to be thinking about. I'm going to give you some mm -hmm. examples, but this includes like paid acquisition, SEO, um, content marketing is technically a practice and the channels through which content marketing come through are going to be like Google search, or it's going to be like referral traffic or what have you. But you can think of content marketing at least as like a marketing practice. Some people do consider it to be a channel, um, but there's also email, there's conferences, there's, you know, every single way that you can acquire a customer can technically be considered a channel, if not a practice itself. Mm. Um, some folks think about like demand generation, account-based marketing as, as being channels slash practices. Uh, but yes, like there's, so there's, you know, a, a ton of ideas. TikTok is a channel, like, like all of the things, right? Mm. Um, but that the list of marketing channels is endless and overwhelming and it changes. Some change very frequently. So social media, like, you know, TikTok wasn't a thing two years ago and now it's very much a thing. Um, but then there's also things that don't change as, as widely. So yes, there are other search engines, but Google is like the 90% shareholder, I think of, of all search traffic. I could be wrong about that. Don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> but Google is, is, you know, the, 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 the big, uh, the, the giant SEO slash search engine provider mm. in the, you know, on the internet today. Mm. Uh, and there aren't very many new entrants into that market. So that doesn't really change a whole lot. Mm. But as you can imagine, there's all kinds of ebb and flow between the different types of channels. Mm. But if you've done your research and what I mean by that is you've talked to prospects, ideal prospects, if not actual paying customers, cause you might have a few paying customers, uh, and your questions that you're going to ask them are going to be, when you're online or offline, where do you hang out? When you want to learn more about your industry, when you want to learn more about your job, when you want to learn more about blah, 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 like you're going to ask them, where do you go? Where do you hang out? And you're going to prompt them and you're going to ask them like, do you like, do you go to conferences? Do you like, do you read blogs? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you watch webinars? Like what, what do you consume if anything? Cause you might not consume anything at all. It's possible. But you're just going to ask them like where they hang out. And then you're also going to ask them like where they spend their time outside of work online, uh, you know, wherever that is. And you're going to find that there's certainly trends, but you'll also discover uh, that there's, there's going to be patterns in what most people discuss from a behavioral perspective, things like searching or being on LinkedIn or being on Facebook. But then you're also going to do your own research outside of talking to customers and prospects. And you're going to use tools like SparkToro, BuzzSumo and um, Ahrefs, Moz, et cetera, and you're going to use that to also identify where your audience most likely hangs out um, and also what they're most likely searching, et cetera. You're going to look for other influencers. You're going to look for people who influence your space. These are also going to give you channel ideas. Perfect. Perfect. OK, that makes total sense to me then. So what about I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot here then a little bit in that. OK, we want to we want to hit that magic number of 100 new customers and Every marketer's answer is right to this question, which is it depends. <laughs> it depends on the business. It depends on the model. It depends on every, lots of different things. But if you were to place a few little bets on some activities that you could probably do quite early on then, what sort of things would you suggest an early, really early stage sort of startup to do then to get those hundred customers over the line? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you foundational and then I'm going to give you some things that we've seen that has worked that may or may not work for your company because of your audience, mm. but it's something to think about. So mm. foundational at bare minimum, you do need to kind of have a baller website. Like it doesn't need to be the most beautiful thing anyone's ever seen, but it does need to have all of the information that someone would need to ultimately make a decision. It's also going to need to have all of the things that, uh, would, give people proof that no one got fired by buying your product. 
<laughs> which sounds crazy, but this is where case studies, testimonials, mm. especially in the B2B space, it's absolutely mm. mission critical. Um, if you're B2C product reviews, like it is, it just sells itself at that point. Mm. Um, but you need social credibility in some kind of way. And you need not just one type of social cred, but you need several types of social cred in terms of the website. I mean, yes, you're going to have like your homepage, you're going to have your features pages, you're going to, you should ideally have a pricing page. And if you're not showing pricing, you're probably missing out. Mm. Um, but beyond just features, pages, pricing, etc., you should be thinking about what's the content that someone would need to consume in order to know how to use my product. So this is where we do get into help documentation, but we also get into product marketing, which is different than just pure help documentation. Mm. And many early teams forget about the product marketing piece. They forget about the content that someone would just need to consume to really understand, oh, I understand the problem. And I also understand why I would use these features. Mm -hmm. And that is mission critical. Not only just like how to use, like how to, like what the features do, but like how to literally use them. Mm -hmm. Some of the best examples of product marketing out there. Um, there's some companies out there that do this extremely well. Um, I'm going to list intercom as one of them, mm. but then there's like, usually like when you see it, you don't realize that like what you're consuming is product marketing, but it actually mm. is like product marketing in disguise. So it can be pretty powerful. Uh, there is a series. So I've heard mixed reviews about this particular series. Like there are some product marketers who totally recommend it. And there are some that are like, uh, like it's like, you know, it's okay. Like from a product marketing perspective, but it kind of gives you an idea. Mm. Uh, I believe his name is Ollie Gardner, if I'm not mistaken, but Ollie at Unbounce did this 30 day product marketing sprint. And what he did was every single day, kind of, he wrote an article about basically like how to use Unbounce. But it was always in the context of the problem that someone would be trying to solve. And a lot of the articles that were produced were pretty good. Um, hmm. There were some that I think like were technically not product marketing, I think technically. Um, but I think that it's a really interesting example for sure. And I think in terms of website, so if we don't have a strong converting experience, it doesn't really matter what traffic we build. It almost doesn't even matter if we do paid acquisition or not. If we're driving traffic to an experience that's not going to convert people, you're going to waste your money. Mm. So what I typically recommend is have an incredible website. Be thinking about early content and release more specifically product marketing. Mm. And then finally, if you are going to test paid acquisition, it doesn't make sense to do it unless you have an incredible website. It doesn't. It mm -hmm. also doesn't make sense to do it unless you have six, month of, six months of budget uh, per channel. So a lot of companies will try to do like, oh, you know, 2K per month across like five channels. Don't do that. Pick one. Mm -hmm. um, you'll probably be looking, at least in the B2B world, you'll probably be looking at Google. I would definitely look at LinkedIn. But I would just keep in mind that it costs more now than ever to acquire mm. a customer. The cost to acquire customers has gone up like seven or eight X, I think is a stat from ProfitWell. I could be wrong. Mm. Um, I should have looked that up before, <laughs> <laughs> before today. But uh, I mean, at least baseline, it costs four times more, if mm. not eight times more, which mm. is a lot. And it is more expensive now to, to acquire a customer, which means that teams have to be extremely savvy about how they're acquiring things. But it also mm. means that they're going to have to place more long term bets. Mm. Short term mm. wins are getting harder and mm. running quick campaigns and getting some quick leads. It's getting harder and harder and harder and more expensive to do that now. Mm. So I would be thinking long term strategies like what are like some of the organic content plays? What are some of the partnerships that you can form? What are some of the uh, just hyper engaging demand generation that you can do that doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to execute, but really costs more, maybe more time or um, has a, like a slightly reduced scope so you can accomplish something similar. I think that mm -hmm. those are some of the avenues that we're finding more and more clients are seeing success with more mm -hmm. so than like the traditional, let's spend a bunch of money on ads. Um, don't get me wrong. It's something that you should test. I'm not mm. going to say it's not going to work. You, you might be surprised, especially mm. if you have an incredible website experience and a great sign up experience and also a great activation experience. <laughs> but, um, if you don't have those three things, paid acquisition is going to be a giant waste of time mm. and you might as well start thinking about long-term bets in the interim. Yeah, because the, the you know the buyers change, doesn't they? The buyers going to be doing a lot of research up front before they're choosing to book that demo to get in contact with you. So that experience needs to be absolutely spot on. Um, what about metrics then, uh, Asia? What sort of metrics should we be thinking about th at this early stage then? Yeah, so there's really 
there's really three tiers of metrics that I think of. So baseline, you should have business metrics. So sign up for ProfitWell. It's free. Um, you're going to get your most basic like subscription metrics. Like what's your MRR? What's the activation rate? Generally speaking, like how many net new mm. customers are you getting? So I think that um, baseline founding teams should have this. And also you should give marketing access to it because it's just, it just helps so much to know like where the company is at at any given time. And I find that the more that we check these kinds of platforms within reason, uh, the more likely we are to actually improve a KPI. The second thing is if you are doing any early, it depends on what kind of marketing you're doing, but uh, the marketing that you're doing, of course, should be uh, measured in some kind of way. This is where it gets kind of tricky because there are some marketing, uh, there's some marketing schools of thought that says focus on some of the more like vanity metrics, things like bounce mm -hmm. rate, things like, um, oh gosh, like there's some other ones like impressions, right? And I, you know, I'm, I'm really, I come from more of like a demand gen angle where mm -hmm. I'm looking more for like, how many trials did we generate? How many leads did, you, did we generate? What was the conversion rate of those things? Um, so I would say, I think, I do think it's ultimately going to just depend on what you're investing in. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, I would say most marketing practices, at least in the early days, should really be focused on just the baselines. So how many leads are we generating month over month? What does the mm -hmm. conversion rate of those look like? Um, if you have more of like a true like B2B sales play, you'd probably be looking at pipeline generated. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's also like if you've got more of like a SaaS, like self-serve play, it's going to be how many trials and mm -hmm. what was the drop off from uh, landing on the website all the way down into now I'm, I'm a trialist to now I'm a paying customer or mm -hmm. they don't become a paying customer. So that's marketing wise. Like we're looking at channel performance in general, but then we're also looking at just overall marketing funnel performance, even though funnel is kind of a funny word because it's not, it's not technically a funnel as we all know, mm. <laughs> but and I think it's, I, mean, I think it's the balance of both, isn't it? You need those sort of hard metrics in terms of stuff further down the funnel. But if you're, certainly from speaking to the marketeers that I do, if you're early stage, then some of that vanity stuff is still pretty important because it gives you a bit of an idea of signals and engagement and brand awareness and that kind of stuff, which if you're a new business, you've kind of got to get your name out there. And, you know, measuring that at least gives you some indicators as to, to what's sort of happening. But um, I'm the same as you. I'm a sort of demand gen sort of focused person yeah. <laughs> rather than the sort of vanity stuff but i think it is a balance of both isn't it um what yeah. about sort of martech should people get too hung up about the sort of tech to support this sort of stuff right now then or can that just wait until further down the line yeah okay so this is an interesting question so going back to the last question about um uh, what metrics should we, should we be tracking there's actually a third category and it's going to tear into the tech that you're going to need mm. so the third category is uh you're going to need product analytics in some kind of way you might not need it early early but you are going to need to measure not just conversion rate uh, from like trial to customer or even, no, I'm just going to say from trial to customer because demo is a little bit different, but from trial to customer, you're going to need to be able to measure this in some kind of way. Mm. And also you're going to need to be able to understand what are the product events. So specific in app behaviors that uh, ultimately tier into better uh, user retention and also better user activation, meaning mm -hmm. um, it's not just about starting the trial, like just starting a trial doesn't indicate if someone's going to buy or not. Mm -hmm. However, starting a trial and also, let's say, creating a list or adding a team member or I don't know, think of like product features that your product has mm -hmm. um, activity that users uh, that are not customers quite yet that are doing, you should be able to measure in some kind of way. Um, what activities do people need to do that most likely generates a customer? Mm. And really this comes down to customer success KPIs. So the, the tech that you would need for this is definitely product analytics. You mm. might not need it immediately, but once you get to your first, I'm going to say like 10 paying customers, you're going to want to start thinking about this, especially if you're anticipating more pipeline, you're just going to be able to measure in some kind of way. So it's going to be uh, something like mix panel, is it? Something like that. Mixed panel amplitude. Yeah. I, I haven't had as much experience with heap, but I believe heap is in this category yep, as well. Yep, yep. But most teams that we work with, they use either mixed panel or amplitude, either mm. one. Mm. Um, but you asked about tech. So mm. I'm going to say product analytics, you know, that's probably something that, that you should just have access to period. Mm. But over time, 
there's certainly marketing automation. There's, of course, like some of the tools that you might use to generate leads, like uh, Sleek Note, like which is like pop ups. There's also like Segmetrics, which is more analytics for channel performance. There's there's a stack that you can certainly craft and pull together. Hmm. Uh, there's not a single stack that I've seen that is consistent across every single company. Every company generally has email marketing. Every hmm. company generally has some form of Google like or um, marketing analytics, whether that's Google Analytics or Segmetrics or something, hmm. or Fathom, could be anything. Hmm. Uh, most companies are generally going to have a way to do some form of lead capture. Maybe that's HubSpot. Maybe that's Sleek Note which is really more like pop-up forms. It's literally mm. just forms um, slash pops up, uh, pop-ups. But like, there's going to be some similarities, but for the most part, everyone uses something different. Mm. Uh, the only tool that I think is most consistent across a lot of the companies that we've worked with has actually been HubSpot mm. because HubSpot has freemium, but then they also, you can of course, um, you know, upgrade into different tiers. But what mm. also is great about HubSpot is Google Analytics certainly gives you some marketing performance, but HubSpot can give you like, like what customers were actually generated from particular channels. Mm. And that is really powerful information where HubSpot gets kind of tricky is when you get into behavior based emails and you have to upgrade quite to big plans to be able to do this. So imagine mm. someone signs up for a free trial and they create a list or they do some activity that's like really awesome or not awesome. Maybe it takes them five days to do anything. Mm. You want to be able to send an email based off of behavior and not necessarily based on time. And HubSpot can, can be kind of tricky with doing this because you've just got to have like certain features enabled. You've got to be on a particular plan. Mm. It can just, you know, it can become a mess. So then there's mm. tools like user list, which can do behavior based sending customer.io, which can do the same thing. This is where you start seeing a little bit more like robust stacks involved and mm. all that kind of stuff. Um, I will say, I think in the early days, you can certainly get away with like a MailChimp or even like yeah. a free HubSpot, yeah. but most teams have to migrate. Mm. Uh, it just it never fails. Like most of them have to migrate to something else. If you want to, you know, bite the bullet and, and do something a little bit more uh, forward thinking in the future mm. based off of your SaaS or your, or your platform, it makes sense to. Um, but just so you know, pretty much everyone starts with something very um, modest and then they expand mm. over time. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So we talked about so much today, haven't we? How does somebody go about getting all this sort of stuff done then? I mean, you know, if you're a startup, it could be a sole marketer that's responsible for this. You could be a founder perhaps working with some freelancers. But, you know, from what you're seeing then, time is a limiting factor, isn't it? Let's be honest, that's not changing. So what are the options that people have got in terms of a getting stuff done perspective? Yeah, I'll give the options, but I'm also going to give you like what the actual secret sauce is. So okay. the options are, uh, there's actually many options. You mm -hmm. can of course hire a full-time team, uh, you as a marketer. So let's, so that's from a founder perspective, but let's say you're a marketer and like, you know, you can also outsource to contractors and freelancers. Founders can also outsource to contractors and freelancers. There's hiring agencies. There's, uh, and usually agencies are amazing at execution, or at least they should be. And uh, those agencies can be more full service. So they, they offer many different services. The agencies can also be specialist. Maybe they only do SEO or they only do content marketing or they only do paid acquisition. Then there's uh, doing it yourself, <laughs> which <laughs> comes with its own really fun bag of, mm. of interesting things that comes with that. Uh, but then there is also, you can hire consultancies. So Demand Maven is technically a consultancy. Do we do execution? Yes, but we're primarily strategy. There's consultancies and then having the consultancy manage freelancers or manage the team. Like there's ways to kind of bring on like whatever it is that you need. And none of these options I would say are ever wrong. I don't think there's ever any wrong option. And I think a lot of teams get kind of caught up in that because they think like, oh, I can't make a mistake. And they're mostly right. But the mistake is almost never in, uh, I'm not going to say who you hire because sometimes you can, you can hire like providers that are not great, <laughs> but <laughs> the mistake is almost always in like just being realistic about what it is that you actually need and can afford. Like that's that is, you know, I think mistake number one. And then mistake number two is um, not actually having a process to enable growth or execution in any kind of way from the get go. I'll start with with 
uh, not really knowing like what we really need. So the truth is like, depending on your own skill set, whether you're a founder or a marketer, depending on your skill set and depending on your bandwidth, your budget, the scope of what you need done, um, any and all of these options could be great. And I think it's just a matter of like just getting brutally honest about what do you need in the short term and also what's the long term effect of this. Uh, it doesn't make sense to bring on an agency, for example, for less than six months. Like, can you actually afford that? Like, what would they be doing? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but then also maybe it's like, you know, you're a kick-ass marketer and you're like, you're amazing at these things, but you're not so great at demand gen. Or maybe mm-hmm. you're get like you're new to account-based marketing and you really want to learn from another provider. So you could bring on, you know, an ABM agency, or you could bring on a demand gen agency, or you could bring on, you know, an SEO agency or whatever it is. And that's a way to kind of fill in, you know, whatever gaps you have. I think from a founder perspective, I think uh, there's a little bit more in some ways uh, pressure slash there's a little bit more cha- there's a few more challenges, but just because you've got to be pretty good at managing mm-hmm. to bring on either a marketing team or even contractors and freelancers. Uh, you have to be a little bit less good at managing when it comes to agencies. But the tricky part, of course, with hiring anyone, whether it's an agency, a contractor, freelancer, a marketer, uh, full time, part time, whatever, is, of course, you've got to be able to trust like what you're getting. Mm-hmm. So a uh, little bit trickier, I think, in some ways for the founder. But mm. being a marketer, usually I feel like we're, we're pretty good at identifying like, oh, OK, like here's what we need and here's like how best to staff the team. Mm. Um, mistake number two or let's say pitfall number two, because uh, I don't want anyone to feel bad in case they've done this because, you know, <laughs> we've all been there. Um, but with pitfall number two, honestly, none of this matters. <laughs> and this is kind of like this is kind of like the aha moments that I've had with clients, you know, just over the years. But it almost like doesn't really matter who you hire if I'm being honest, because if you don't have a process for executing against growth or marketing anyway, it doesn't really matter who you bring on because they literally can't execute. Mm. Uh, Like there's no way for them to execute. Well, they might do stuff, uh, meaning like they might go build the landing page. They might go launch the campaign or they might go write the copy or whatever it is. But unless you have a process for deploying that in a meaningful way, it doesn't really matter what like execution like actually gets done. Mm. So what I find is teams that win at marketing and growth, usually they are ones that meet regularly. They report on the wins. They also retrospect on the not so great things on either the losses or the, oh, this didn't work. And they are constantly um, in discussion about opportunities and also gaps to fill they are also usually pretty consistent about doing some form of customer research in addition to really um, aligning and operationalizing around customer success. When those things all come together, they have a really solid process for executing. They have a really solid process internally for thinking about strategy, reflecting on strategy, and then like actually literally executing when those things are all aligned. That's when you can really throw any resource into the mix Uh, When you don't have that, what you get is you get contractors, freelancers who are executing, but they don't really know like how it tears up into the ultimate vision or like how it actually impacts goals. You also don't know if you're not measuring anything and then therefore can't really tell like the contractor, freelancer or marketing person or whoever like what to do. Um, Agencies will go a mile a minute if you if you give them space and time to. And if they are not strategically aligned with where the company is at, with who the customer is and the journey, then they're going to execute a bunch of stuff that doesn't ultimately move the needle. And this is really um, this is really the drawback, I think, to bringing on any kind of team. But at the same exact time, if you've got those things together, then you're going to be able to execute against growth, marketing, whatever it is. And it's going to be great. Um, You're going to have your challenges, but you're going to have really good ways to overcome them because you've, you've got a good process. And I think Mm -hmm. like process is really where it all comes down to. If there's no process, like it, it's just a bunch of stuff like thrown into a tumbler and then maybe we get polished rocks and maybe we don't, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it's a, it's a coin toss. Makes sense. Makes sense. So final question, flipping it slightly then let's say you're a founder knowing what you know then, and you're going to hire your first marketeer for a startup then a B2B tech startup. What sort of skills and attributes would you look for? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you the very quick playbook for how to hire a marketer (laughs) uh, if you've never hired one before. Okay. So here's what you have to look for. You need to look for a marketer 
who has experienced your specific stage of growth. And they've ex like, so for example, if you're like, we've got zero customers and we need to get to a thousand, you're hiring a marketer who's done literally that. Uh, if you are at a thousand customers and you're trying to get to 10,000, you're going to hire a marketer who's done that and so on and so on. So first you're going to need the right stage of marketer. Like, uh, like this person has, has achieved a similar level of growth or whatever it is for a similar stage of company. You don't have to have a marketer who knows the vertical perfectly. You don't have to you don't have to find someone who's like been in the industry. Like, like, let's say you, you know, I use this example all the time. Um, but let's say like you're a CRM for trucking companies. You don't have to go hire a marketer who's like, you know, lived and breathed trucking. You really just need a marketer who has achieved a similar stage of growth for a similar type of business. So if you are self-serve, you want to hire a, like a marketer who's probably done, who's done self-serve in some kind of way before. What you wouldn't want to necessarily do is you wouldn't want to hire like a super senior enterprise VP of marketing for an, a super early stage self-serve SaaS that's like B2C. Mm -hmm. Like those are two to like diametrically opposed things. Could that person mm -hmm. do it? Sure. But like, mm -hmm. but you just, you're, you're gambling, I think at that point. Mm -hmm. So um, you want similar stage, you want similar, um, you want a similar business type, I'm going to say, or model type. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, probably don't hire the like VP of marketing slash sales who sold like 50 K, you know, annual deals, unless like, that's what you're kind of, unless that's what you're doing. Mm. Um, especially like if you're like, you know, self-serve or something, but so those are the, like the top two things I would look for. The mm. third thing I would look for is of course, you're going to look for culture fit. Do you vibe with this mm. marketer? The fourth thing I would look for is, can this marketer explain things to you in a way that you're going to understand? Uh, one of the biggest, I think, um, gaps between founders and marketers, especially if the founder is technical, is that the technical founder needs to be communicated with in a way that they are going to understand. Mm -hmm. And finding a marketer who can do that super well, don't get me wrong, dime a dozen, but um, actually, no, is that true? Dime a dozen? Uh, I think it's more like, it's it's hard to find, I will say. Mm. Um, but that is, I think, going to also be critical because it's going to impact a lot of your working relationship. And also you're going to want to make sure that you actually understand what the marketer is saying, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially if they're using terminology or words or phrases mm -hmm. that they don't, that you don't, like you're not familiar with, or you're not really sure why it's important. Um, I also think too, depending on the level of seniority and also the level of expertise, the marketer is kind of telling you what to do as opposed to you telling the marketer what to do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really a question of how much do you want to manage this person um, or do you really want to bring someone on who's slightly more experienced and you do less managing? That's kind of a question for you to answer, but it's something I ask about all the time. Uh, whenever a founder or a founding team is looking to hire their very first marketer, I'm, you know, I'm going to ask the question, who's going to manage this person? Do you want to manage this person or do you want them to tell you what to do? Because if mm. they're telling you what to do, they're probably more experienced and a little bit more senior. Mm. Um, not always, but they certainly can be. Yeah. And it's striking and then, that balance. Oh, yeah. It's striking that balance, isn't it, between the seniority and somebody being hands-on enough as well. For sure. And I think the last thing I'll 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 give you for my you know playbook on hiring uh, is going to be it's going to be a question of do you need someone in the more demand gen space, or do you need someone in the more awareness building brand building space? And mm. this is one of the hardest choices to make because you don't often know as a technical founder. Um, but nine times out of 10, sometimes eight times out of 10, we'll recommend a, uh, a marketer who's coming in with like, um, they've got some experience demand gen wise, meaning they are, uh, they are equipped to generate sales ready leads in some kind of way, whether that's using paid acquisition, content marketing, product marketing, like whatever it is, demand gen marketers, uh, especially ones with SaaS experience, it's, it's, you know, it's not super hard to find, but you certainly like, I would say it's more frequent than you'd think, um, or more like common than you think, uh, the brand awareness, kind of like awareness building marketers. Mm. These are definitely like you, you can find tons of marketers in this area. It's, it's very rare though, that we make a recommendation of hiring, like the more brand awareness kind of building marketer but only because usually the top KPI is traffic for a brand awareness marketer for a demand gen marketer. The top KPI is trials and or demos. It's, it's like the people coming in the door, like doing the thing. Mm. 
Hmm. Usually, uh, most, most of the time we recommend like the more demand gen marketer. Um, when we recommend the brand awareness marketer, it's usually because they're super VC funded. They've got like real big brand vision and they almost like they need tons of awareness and tons Mm -hmm. of, uh, like buzz for their go-to market strategy to work. Mm -hmm. It's rare that we recommend this person, but when we do, it's usually like really obvious, like, oh, you need someone to just go and like, like, you know, you know, blow up the PR channels (laughs) and, generate like a ton of traffic for you that's like top of the funnel or middle of the funnel and just go ham on that it's Mm. super rare though like like i said it's like one to two times out of ten usually it's the demand gen side that's what most teams tend to need Mm. well i love that playbook and asia generally i could listen to you all day it's been fantastic (laughs) talking to you so if anybody's got some follow-up questions if anybody wants to talk to you if anybody wants to hire you what's the best way of them getting in touch with you yeah okay so if you just want to chat. I'm an open book. Please hit me up on Twitter. I am at Asia Arangio. If you would like to hire us or learn more about our services, head over to demandmaven.io. That is where we are. And that's where all of our services are, all the things that we do, in addition to some of the fun stories and content that we provide as well. Um, but yeah, I would say Twitter is definitely the way to, to reach out. If you just want to chat, I'm an open book. Ask me any questions. Happy to answer. And otherwise, um, thanks again for having me. And this was incredible. Asia, you've been a superstar. Thanks again.